being here. My name is Sarah Rudolph. I'm at the MPCA. I'm uh, spending about half my time these days on green set cities and the other half on urban forestry. So this is um, like the pinnacle of my year today. <laughs> World's colliding. But um, I'm really happy to be here along with all of you and presenting this topic. It's springtime here in Minnesota. The trees are leafing out almost, and um, it's a good time to think about them. So, I um, we're gonna I'm just gonna walk through the agenda briefly here. <clears throat> we're gonna have Jeff Hackner from Rainbow Tree Care speak about perceptions of um, trees, urban tree priorities for cities, and um, how cities value trees. And then we're going to have a little discussion after that, followed by three mini sessions, and then further discussion and Q&A. So that's kind of the format of our morning. Um, okay. So let's start with people in the room. I'm going to pass on the microphone. We're going to just um, say our names and organizations. Emily Northey, Preservation Alliance of Minnesota. Patrick Rathwaite, Minnesota Green Corps member. Uh, Jeff Packer, Minnesota. Steve Weiser, the New Shorty. Kate Wally, City of Sidley. John Evans, Hennepin County. Bill Music, MPCA. Peter Lundstrom, Clean Energy Resource Teams. Kirsten Tager, City of Hutchinson. Valerie Price, the University of Minnesota. Uh, Danielle Cabot, League of Minnesota City. Tommy Matani, City of Eden Prairie. Gary Johnson, University of Minnesota. Addison Lewis, WSB and Associates. Jeremy Gumke, City of St. Anthony. And on the webinar, we have Amber Brooks Muller, Andrew Hogg, Chris Drakopard, Jacob Thunder, Lisa Donabauer, Michael Orange, Rob Friend, Sharon McLeay, and Terry Gibbs. Thank you, Patrick. Um, <clears throat> at this point, I'm going to introduce Jeff Hackner. Jeff is the director of municipal consulting at Rainbow Tree Care, where he partners with cities to develop, adopt, and implement urban forest management strategies. Wow. Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff speaks nat nationally on forestry issues and has brought the concept of regional cooperative EAB management to numerous states and regions. He's a member of the American Society of Consulting Arborists, an ISA certified arborist, and has been working in the horticulture industry for over 20 years. Hi, everyone. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeff. I tripped there up on my bio because I was joking mine far too long. I just have a stock bio that I send out for every occasion. and. Uh, Maybe I'm overselling myself. So, um, urban forest priorities, both perceived and real. And I realized, of course, after I submitted all of this work, uh, my editor read that title and thought, are the cities perceived and real? <laughs> no, uh, it's uh, the urban forest priorities that are both perceived and real. Uh, let me figure out my technology. <laughs> Bear with us, everyone. A lot of technology going on. Oh, that part. Okay, so, uh, of course, I want to thank the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency for this fantastic program. I'm a big fan of this program. Certainly uh, excited to be here and to be in person and online. And everybody's favorite best management practice number 16. Um, they move to the middle because the middle is where people are most engaged. That they start off slow and end slow, but in the middle, that's where the action takes place. So, uh, urban forests and what we're trying to do, and there 
our best practices on the website, these drive a lot of the decisions if you're if you're trying to become a green step city. So it starts out fairly straightforward, certified green city, moves on to more difficult. Um, number six, five, four. Those are all a little harder to do. Lots of emphasis on tree planting, which is great. I'm not going to focus as much on tree planting except to compare it uh, with other strategies. I believe that perception also influences your actions. If you're a city or a tree manager of any kind, how you see trees, how you perceive trees, is going to influence what you do to keep or protect or replace them. The first one I want to talk about is that young trees are equivalent to old trees. I also want to talk about the trees don't require maintenance, care, or protection, and that green grain infrastructure are the same. Now, we'll discuss these individually. But first, I want to talk about this article that was just published in a journal online uh, with a group of people. I'll give them credit. But the big thing they're focused on is an ecology for cities. They believe that too much of an ecology use of cities work has left people without room for action. Uh, so what they say really is that novel solutions are needed today if our cities are to have any hope of more sustainable and resilient futures. Now that seems a little grim. We have to start today if there's any hope. Um, I believe that that at least is moving some of us towards greater action. And I want to pull out these two words, of course, sustainable and resilient. The key features uh, but why? Why do we need sustainability and resiliency? Well, we got some big things to do, and of course, I'm going to talk about climate change because I still can. You told me I can't yet. Um, some places of the country they have, I think that's a dangerous approach. But um, with climate change, of course, we're going to have heat extremes, we're going to have droughts, and we're going to have floods. And if you're a landscape designer, and somebody comes to you and says, you have to design a landscape for heat extremes. Okay, I can do that. Also include droughts. Okay, we can kind of do that. I'll just try to, you know, get all my water to be used efficiently. But, oh, you also have to design for floods. It starts to make it a little more problematic to design for all of this, especially when you're dealing with this. And I pull this up, and I understand what how this can be viewed. Uh, we are, of course, in that nice blue area. I think we all know this is a serious problem uh, driven largely by carbon, and that's going to be important later on. In addition to climate change and our need for sustainability and resiliency, we are having ever-increasing population growth. So these things are uh, making it hard to live and manage our green and gray infrastructures. What we really need is some sort of infrastructure superhero. We need a piece of infrastructure that can give us energy savings and things that improve our air quality. Well, that's a lot to ask right there. In air quality, it would be nice if we had some sort of infrastructure superhero that not only made the air cleaner, but also took carbon out of it. We could somehow draw carbon out of the atmosphere and put it into something that didn't cause as much damage. That would be great. But if we could also reduce stormwater runoff at the same time, it would be pretty sweet. It would be a lot to ask of an infrastructure superhero. If you could also maybe improve wildlife habitat at the same time, it'd be pretty sweet. Even reduce crime and noise, now we're really talking. But superheroes can be kind of arrogant, kind of big ego, kind of tough to deal with. So in addition to all of this, it would be nice if they're also popular with the people. And of course, the tree guy, trees are this infrastructure superhero. They absolutely are. The only difference I would make is that superheroes are pretty indestructible. They don't need a lot of help from everybody else. Trees aren't quite the same. They do a lot of work on their own just by standing there naturally, uh, but they do need our help and our protection. So let's start with the perceptions that influence our actions. The first one, young trees are equivalent to old trees. Young trees are not equivalent to old trees in any way, shape, or form. And I kind of stacked the deck here in my favor. I chose a little dead tree. I'm comparing it to a big, old, live tree. I get it. Kind of exaggerating the point. A couple things I want to point out. They're both in the public right-of-way. These are providing public benefits, both near streets, reducing that stormwater runoff into that street, 
And one of them has a lot of fake to grow roots and trunk branches. One of them does not. Yes, this one died on the left. One on the left died, but it didn't have the same future ahead of it this old one did, not only in places to grow, but in conditions to grow in environmentally. The climate is changing, the weather is changing, that tree on the left is going to have a much harder 100 years ahead of it than this one did. I also want to point out, um, in the discussion of young trees are not the same as old trees, that tree on the left has, with it, lots of inputs. There's, there's this general concept that if this tree on the right needed protection from some sort of guaranteed invasive death or death from an invasive species. No amount of energy or input should be added to that tree to help preserve it. That replacement tree is coming with a whole lot of input. The, the amount of energy and resources it takes to grow trees in mass in nurseries, very intensive. Not only that, we truck them many, many miles using lots of fossil fuels get them into place using lots of equipment, lots of human hours, and then they die, it's not even, it's not even a fair comparison. That tree on the right deserves much more protection to keep it functioning than that tree on the right. And I love tree planting. I love it. It's fantastic. But it's not our only strategy. This also influences my philosophy on big trees versus old trees. We know that now that large trees grow faster and store more carbon than those young trees. And that contradicts all of the assumptions we've made that little trees grow faster, little trees are better. So um, the trees get older, they get bigger, and it means they absorb more carbon, which we need. We need lots of carbon absorption from the atmosphere, and this is completely flying in the face of what we use. So also in the conversation of young trees are not equivalent to old trees, we can plant and we can plant and we can plant, they don't all live. So this author was looking at, well, how many do we need? In a real world situation where we put a lot of trees into people's hands and into the ground, how many do we need to be successful? We need way more than we're doing. She found that it was apparent that tree planting and natural gene regeneration are insufficient because they don't all live. We have souls and we do stem counts and all this stuff, but they don't all survive losing more trees that we can possibly replace with what we're currently doing. I love tree planting. I think everyone should be planting trees. I can see people changing their presentations for after mine to re so re rebut some of my claims. Anyway, more uh, perceptions that influence actions. Trees don't require maintenance or care or protection. And I've heard this even in a more devastating way, like trees shouldn't require. This idea that trees grow in the forest, we've never had to help trees in the forest. Why should we have to help trees in the city? Uh, cities and forests aren't the same. Also, trees are made of wood. Lumber is wood. Therefore, trees are lumber. Lumber doesn't need care. So we should prune trees like they're lumber. Again, trees growing in the public space, not only by parking lots, but by trees, <laughs> provide very very great numbers of benefits and should be revered and cared for. Uh, this pruning, oops. hey, look at that. There okay. This pruning right here, um, for those on the webinar that can't see, those big circles that you can see on the trunk of the tree are pruning cuts. Uh, they're very large relative to the trunk that they're removed from. Uh, it's a lot of the living tissue that's removed all at once. And I would say that this is a result of not a lot of uh, care that the trees are there and fit specifications that are focused mainly on what is cheapest and not in what is best in the best interest of all of us. So, uh, also trees don't require maintenance because trees grow, let's talk about roots. They grow roots in the forest just fine. No problems in the forest growing roots. So roots in the forest are just like roots in the city. They're not, not the same at all. Um, it's going to be hard to see kind of right in here, but when you look at big trees in the forest, what you see are uniform roots, clearly distinguishable at the trunk, 
radiating away from the trunk uniformly in all directions. What you see in the city is more one-sided, flat-sided. You can sometimes not see roots emerging at all. Uh, this is a combination of a lot of things, but it starts out like this. Uh, again, nursery production, planting methods, all this stuff kind of, kind of culminates in uh, roots that don't radiate uniformly from the trunk. Don't continue out uh, in all directions. They start to they stop short. They circle. They don't all come off at the same height. It's not the same, and that burn ends up being very damaging long term. As the stem grows into that root, they conflict. You get a lot of uh, growth problems that occur above the ground. Also, with roots in the city, uh, we treat the soil like this. Just because we can build it doesn't mean we should. And Maybe you can see in the back, they're building a big stone wall, uh, lots of boulders. Um, we can build boulder walls in landscapes. We absolutely can. But it requires a whole lot of skid steer work, a whole lot of heavy equipment work, and thousands of trips back and forth, completely compressing that soil, damaging the roots that are there, and changing how the water moves across the surface. Where it may used to penetrate the soil, now it can't because there's no pore space for that water to move into. And these might be public trees. They might be private. It's right on the line. However, this project is big enough that it probably required a permit of some sort. So this municipality would have had an opportunity to review this plan, take into consideration the trees that are growing there, those trees that are providing public good, um, and possibly steer the construction around the trees to give them more protected space. So OK, let's talk root protection. Let's say, OK, I hear you. We need to protect the root. We need to get in there as part, of, as part of the permitting process. We need to protect the root. This is not root protection. This is a five-acre site that's being redeveloped. It used to have one house on it. It's going to have eight now. But you can see they're trying. They didn't cut the tree down. So maybe they're considering that as being protection. They put up a fence of sorts. Uh, didn't stay up. but. Um, they still dug, and here in the picture on the right, you can see lots of roots sticking out where they just excavated up to a point. They gave those roots no attention, no care. Now they're just left to dry out. There was probably also no work beforehand to reduce the stress levels of that tree before the excavation took place. That tree probably is not going to last in the landscape. So I'll let the developer might get credit for preserving it. If it doesn't live more than three years after that, it shouldn't really count in my opinion. So we'll talk more perception. Green and gray is the structure of the same. And there are times when I want that to be the case. When it comes to um, like looking at the benefits of infrastructure, I want green and gray to be considered the same. And the summary on the website um, kind of alludes to that, that investments that protect green infrastructure provide benefits just as investments in gray infrastructure. And one of the things that includes gas and electric. So if you think about it, if you want to plant a tree in your yard, what you should do first is make sure there's no underground utility. That's for your own safety. But it's also to protect those utilities. Now imagine if I have a really high value tree it's on my property line with my neighbor. If my neighbor wants to build a big stone patio. Nobody comes out to make sure there's no roots there first. Although those roots are just as much a key component of our infrastructure system as the telephone line. The more so, really. Sure, telephones are great. Gas lines are great. They're not providing the human health benefits that those trees are proving to show. So for your consideration. So if we say, all right, trees equal green infrastructure, and green infrastructure equals gray infrastructure, that's great. What happens when now there's a battle between green infrastructure and gray infrastructure? It's going to happen. It happens constantly. Increasing in population, our cities are growing, this is going to happen. So when that happens, then suddenly green infrastructure is not equal to gray infrastructure. Green infrastructure is less than gray infrastructure because everybody gets it. Everybody gets how important a curb is or a road is, how much, it, how much money it takes to repair that or replace it. But the focus is not on the trees. And even when it is, 
it's not sufficient in my opinion. I'll show you an example. This is a case study. This is a road I take to work every day. And this road needs to be expanded. And I get it. I drive this road every day to work. I'm part of the problem. Too much traffic on this road requires expansion. Okay, fine. So we'll we'll deal with the expansion now. And I want to focus on this area right here for those uh, on the webinar, maybe you can see better. The first picture I'm going to be taking at the upper right hand corner of that black box and I'm going to move down the street. Now, I frequently want to tell stories with pictures, but I can't see into the future, so I can't take pictures of sites like their before pictures because I don't know where development can necessarily take place. However, our good friends at Google uh, take pictures of everything all the time, especially from the street. So I'm happy to take screenshots of their street view photos to share as a before. And for those of you who can't see it, folks, this, but this picture was taken on September, or in September of 2011. And giving Google credit, you can see Shady Oak Road. I'm not, not fabricating this story. This is really what that street looked like before the construction. Part of the plan, we've got to take out these trees. Moving down the street, we've got to take out these trees. Now we're looking back from that next intersection, back up. That was a beautiful, right in the middle, that, that cornerstone tree there. Probably a 40-inch American elm, just a fantastic specimen. Now all those people in those houses got bought out, those houses were all gone. But while the people lived there, that tree was, I'm sure, a key reason for enjoying that house, at least if they were trees. Um, so those trees got to go, they're in the way, more gray infrastructure. We'll replace the green, it's fine, we're going to replace it. Uh, here you can see this is a little wetland, all of those trees around the wetland are gone, and you know, I call this the price of progress. The first rain event after those trees are gone, that wetland flooded. Now I've been taking this road every day to work for seven years. I've never seen that. And you can see there's a fence there. They, they did what they're supposed to. They did what the project called for. They put up a, a barrier to keep construction material out of the water and water out of the construction site, and it failed instantly. First rain event, it wasn't falling on the tree canopy, wasn't falling on the soil that could absorb it. It all ran down the hill and completely overwhelmed the system. So, let me see what I should say. Are green and gray the same? Yes, they are when I want them to be. <laughs> when they're necessary, they're always necessary. They all provide benefits. They all require maintenance and protection. And the science tells us what works. And what I'd like to make sure I say is that no green infrastructure system was ever failing before we got there. Everything was functioning beautifully when any developer of any kind in any age showed up to a wetland and thought, this soil is not draining well enough. They knew it was a wetland. It wasn't supposed to necessarily, but if we want to build there, we got to get the water out. Water's just in our way. So the science tells us what we're, we, we've done amazing things with construction projects. That, that little street reconstruction project I showed you is a marvel of human engineering. We know the same is true with the green side. We know what works, what doesn't. And we know now more what's in our best interest. Where green and gray are not the same, heavy machinery is not green infrastructure tool of choice. Heavy equipment and green infrastructure, they don't mix. It's too delicate of a system to just be driving over it constantly. There's too much going on both above ground and below ground. And when gray infrastructure is replaced, we all consider it crude. When green infrastructure is supposed to be replaced, I don't feel the same way. Those small trees are not the same, even if they're two to one or three to one. So, oh, what about soil as green infrastructure? I'll let you think about that for a second. What about it? Soil is a, a living biome of activity and an interconnected web of organisms that live in a symbiotic relationship. But not during construction, not. During construction, nobody cares. It's way faster to build a huge house and you have complete and total access to the site. And my soil construction at school would say, there's no soil left. That's dirt. There's nothing living, there's nothing biotic. Look, it hasn't even rained uh, for days, and that picture on the right shows standing water. That site will never take on water like it did 
before this construction. So the gray infrastructure, the public gray infrastructure that surrounds it, was designed for a yard that could absorb stuff. Now it has to take on basically bordering a yard that can't. But it's okay. It's okay. Again, our friends at Google captured a picture for me last July. We just smoothed it out, and then we just covered it up with grass. It's fine. Don't be the wiser. Except for Google Street View and me looking at it. But now, let's say, okay, our best practices for this city are to plant trees. Trees aren't going to grow there. The soil is now too compacted. There's nothing living in it anymore. If you're lucky to be able to dig a hole to get a tree in the ground, the roots won't really even be able to emerge past the, the hole you dig. So if, again, this is a project that required oversight at the permitting phase, uh, we could have done something. We could have limited traffic to the driveway that already existed, heavy equipment only on the driveway. We could have left all that living soil as a, as a piece of green infrastructure. It was providing benefits to the city. What if we combine soil compaction and we increase the building footprint? So now we've doubly eliminated green infrastructure space. And this was on the left, 2014, so just last summer. This was taken just this week. Uh, you can see the shadow of my Google car here. Uh, people who work on construction sites always kind of stop to wonder why you're taking pictures out of your car window. I try to just tell them I'm admiring their work. <laughs> <laughs> so, as I said earlier, novel solutions being necessary because we need sustainability and we need resiliency. Uh, so let's talk about some of those. And some of those, some of these are not that novel, except that we're not doing them. So on paper, they don't seem that novel. But if we were really doing it, if we were really taking it on like this, that would be amazing. That would be altering the, the future of our green and gray infrastructure relationships. Oops. So we need to invest in successful tree planting and initiatives. Now, I'm not criticizing any tree planting initiatives that are currently taking place, but success has to be part of the goal. It has to be measurable and attainable, and it has to be funded. There has to be money that ensures that success is obtained. Um, we need to design a bill for large trees, and I, I think some of the speakers later today are going to touch on this. It has to be part of the design initially. The, that, that article that I cited, their big thing was we achieve our greatest impact <coughs> on sustainability at the design phase. Because everything after that, it's just kind of, we're rolling with it. If we make changes at the beginning, then we can, we can see real results at the end. Uh, we need to consider the environments above and below ground. This would be huge if, if developers knew what they had below their feet uh, when they started projects. That would be a significant change in how things are done. Uh, we need to strengthen tree planting specifications to avoid long-term root issues. Again, if you have a tree planting guideline, make it stronger. I don't think you can make them strong enough. Make, make, the, make the private industry guarantee the trees survive for 50 years. I mean, it seems completely unreasonable, but we require the same thing on the gray side. We don't let people build streets that fall apart five years later. And we need to continually, constantly plan for climate change. And I don't just mean like it's going to get warmer. Um, we can't restrict our tree planting species uh, to say an environment that existed 100 years ago. Uh, I, I like trees that grew here 100 years ago. The next 100 years is going to be very, very different, and that has to be part of our strategy. Of course, my big thing is <laughs> uh, my big thing is we've got to preserve and protect. And this takes shape in a lot of ways. Uh, but with Emerald Ash Borer specifically on our doorstep in our community, this has to be taken seriously. We need to protect the green and gray equally. We need to strengthen requirements in code language and permitting. The big one, again, we could make huge strides if we were to do this. We need to not remove our high-quality trees. 
because of an assumed environmental impact on preserving them. And that's a lot of words. But what I mean is it's easy to say we can't protect ash trees from EAV, for instance, because it's going to require some chemical input. But like I tried to make the case earlier, so do the replacement trees. Chemical inputs, carbon footprint inputs, all this stuff. It's all part of a bigger picture. And the big trees provide so many more benefits. Um, and I think we need to consider public and private trees as shared resources. Yes, there are lines that the public shall not cross into private, but we have lots of ways in which permits are granted, site reviews are completed, and more emphasis on what trees are doing, even on the private side, um, I think is very important. Now, I don't want to skip to the end um, without passing this by. I've been involved in some state legislative <coughs> action regarding trees and tree protection. I don't have enough time to talk about it today, but if anybody's interested, it's a very important issue, and if you are a member of a city or live in a city, uh, I think it's important. So uh, please follow up with me regarding that, and I'd be happy to talk about it. But before I go, I, of course, have to show a big ash tree. <coughs> I pause. Mm. We will never replace that tree. It's surrounded by sidewalks and streets and construction. No other tree is going to ever grow that big in that space in any of our life. I'd be surprised if the tree ever grew that big in that space. That tree, far too valuable to simply cut down. In my opinion. Now, this is in the city of Hopkins. They are protecting that tree again. So, any questions? I'm happy to take now. There's a few. Terry Gibbs um, has a few questions, oh, man. <clears throat> and then Mike Orange too just submitted one. So, Terry Gibbs says first, thanks for this excellent presentation. I've learned a lot and really appreciate how clearly uh, you present concepts. I'm wondering how hard it is and cost effective to actually do building projects without soil compaction, and then. On the example you gave, was there, or I guess maybe would there be a win-win solution um, for the road building project you mentioned that would preserve the trees and expand the road? Great question, and thank you for the, the complimentary words. Um, I guess if you're going to ask really hard questions, it's good to start with, hey, great job. By the way, I have some really hard questions. A win-win for me, in my opinion, is that the green infrastructure survives for decades. That's a win-win for everybody. The problems we're facing both in our air quality and our climate warming due to carbon as far exceeds any short-term benefit of we need to save $10,000 on a construction site or a building site. Like, I don't care. <laughs> that they're building massive houses because the market is there, and the people that buy massive houses buy massive houses. And if we level the playing field and require everybody to preserve that green infrastructure, then um, then all things are equal, in my opinion. The, the road expansion project is a much harder one. Um, I think anytime you're expanding a roadway, you're going to run into trees. Uh, what can I say? Maybe reduce cars. Maybe? I don't know. I don't know. There's not a great solution. I think that if, if our current status quo is that we replace trees because we can, because those small trees are equal to, then we keep cutting big trees down. If we change the status quo and say, no, those big trees absolutely cannot be replaced, what design, what do the designs look like that preserve them, uh, then, then we start to find solutions. It's like anything, any big problem. Of course, we can't see all the solutions now because nobody's incentivized on a big way to really look for them. I hope that answers it. This is Sarah. I, um, I have some good news for you, Jeff. We just learned that the city of Edina has a new tree preservation ordinance. Uh, it was published a couple weeks ago. It goes into effect later this summer, but the, I'm going to read this from my email. The purpose is to preserve trees during the redevelopment process while still allowing reasonable development to occur and not to interfere with the property owner's reasonable use of their property. The ordinance restricts the amount of unnecessary tree loss by requiring mitigation for the removal of trees outside the basic tree removal area. 
which is 10 feet, a 10 foot radius of the building pad uh, and a 5 foot radius of driveways. So um, I just want to give props to Edina because I think that's really forward thinking. And uh, what do you think about that? Yeah, that's great. It is very forward thinking. And uh, it is in a reaction to massive amounts. Well, not the massive. That's my word. I don't know. Statistically, the numbers of houses that have been increased in footprint over the last 10 years in Edina, I'm making the assumption that it's a lot. Uh, so that that new guideline or permit, what would you even call it? It's a law? Any law? No. It's an ordinance. It's an ordinance. Um, there's a reaction. It's a great start. I hope that a lot of communities pick up language like that and start looking even more forward to Edina. A little closer to that inner ring. They're under a lot more like infill pressure. We have a lot of ground to make in the suburbs where space is abundant. So we build with impunity and we excavate with impunity. So good start. Ready to go down. And so there's more questions from Terry. And uh, so I guess I don't know. Just to make sure that you answer the first part of that question, is there a cost-effective way to do right. like the building project? And then I guess I have my own kind of in par with that. Um, is there a way so if they if it soil is compacted before they cover it with grass, would it be, is there a way to revitalize the soil? Right. So yes, there is. To the second point, cost-effective. I get tripped up on cost-effective because. There's so many costs in big building projects like that. Like, you know, what would be good? It, you know, is a five percent increase in total construction cost uh, a win? And that's where I don't really know. To me, the the long term benefit is the cost thing because we spend thousands of dollars trying to remediate uh, urban landscapes that can't grow plants and can't absorb water after the fact. So in all planning, it seems to me that an ounce of prevention is worth something, something, something. something. So um, yes, you can remediate the soil with lots more input. So you can get specialty tools that, that blow air in the soil. You can take compost or organic matter and add it back to the soil. Uh, but again, we're just trying to catch up. And if you still, you still done damage far deeper than you can remediate typically because that compaction layer goes way down after your thousands and thousands of trips. So it's not impossible, but it seems like preventing it on the front end is a better, is a better stretch. So I hope I answered it. Yeah, so so, so when we when we see um, so when we see development sites we, we see those what two foot orange or if we see the plastic nitty and the uh, stakes in the ground and the idea is that there's no compaction or soil disturbance beyond that right. distance. City ordinances can um, <coughs> control for where the fences are, I mean code ordinances, uh, be more precise and specific about where the fence line goes. Yes, not only where the fence goes, how rigid is the fence, how protected is that protected root zone, so for instance, in California, you need six feet high rigid fencing in a predetermined area inside of which no activity will take place ever. It's locked gate. You cannot even walk in there. They also require that any roots exposed during excavation will have clean cuts made, like will be increased to try to offset any of those damages that might occur. So not only can you increase or get very firm on where the fence goes, but the fence looks like activities around the excavation outside the fence, all of that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. We yeah, absolutely can. I don't see any reason why not. We tell people they can't build 20 story buildings in the suburbs. We tell them they can't, you know, do lots of stuff. Yeah, question in the back? Yeah. As a general rule of thumb, we usually put those fences, I mean my experience, around the drip line. Is that adequate or would you like to see more? Uh, drip lines are very start, but it depends so much on what is the species of the tree, what age class is the tree, is it a young tree, mature tree, is it over mature tree, uh, what kind of soil it's growing in. Uh, the drip line is a decent start, but 
the calculations I've seen for especially sensitive over mature trees, maybe those trees that are are, are really providing a lot of benefit, uh, drip lines are insufficient. We want to give it more space. So where do we find that for their guidance? Uh, I can make it available. Yeah, I, I can't give you the URL right now, but um, it's available. So if you send that to me, I can send that out to all the attendees. I'm happy to do that. Uh, yeah, as a, as a representative of the, uh, the government organization that uh, was behind the Shady Oak 61. Yeah, I'm um, in your input. Well, you know, I, I don't know that we can really change what's going on with that project, but I, it, what you're saying is, is, has not been um, lost on us, and we're actually in the process of developing a stable landscape standards for for projects, and so it's it's really something that down the road um, we're making a concerted effort to try to address. I remember reading in the in kind of the pre-construction spec that reducing flooding was one of the goals of that yeah of that project, and it seemed like the natural wetland area got drained, and then retention ponds got moved outside of that. Yeah, I think historically, um, maybe the side street next to Shady Oak Road used to flood. Okay. And so that was a big focus of that area. And um, yeah, retention ponds are kind of a standard approach to stormwater control. You know, again, that's stormwater is going to be part of what we look at, too, sure. um, going down the road. Are wetlands considered an approach to, to flood control as well? Um, yeah, yeah, I think so. And um, going further out, we're also looking at kind of a more holistic approach in terms of how we evaluate our capital capital projects, bringing in natural resource considerations, whereas in the past, the road project has tended to be focused on um, traffic numbers, safety, you know, strictly transportation stuff, but we're trying to expand that too. Gotcha. Well, that's exciting. That's encouraging. I love it. Thank you for speaking up. Sure. Uh, just to piggyback on that a little bit, um, some of the examples that you were, you've been given, or giving rather, have to do with uh, areas of the city that are either doing greenfield development of houses and large houses and so on, sort of a rarefied atmosphere there. But, um, could you talk a little bit about uh, sort of the gritty city, the small lot areas trying to regreen those areas when um, there's industrial areas, there's um, large freeway sure. you know, areas, and really the only open land is, is next to the freeways or next to larger highways. But because of MnDOT regulations, you can't plant trees along there because somebody might have an accident and went into them. Sure. But they would provide, I mean, it's the only wide to put anything. Right. So, you know, we have sort of a dilemma because we have tiny lots, we can't, we can make a big effort to be, that's not going to provide enough trees. Right. And I think uh, that is an example of what I was kind of getting at, like, these planting efforts in themselves are insufficient. So, what then can we do to protect and preserve the bigger trees that are still in good health, are still providing those benefits, while we try to figure it out? And, and what I was talking about before, you can remediate uh, at least compaction in soil, you can add organic matter uh, to try to make those smaller planting sites more hospitable for tree roots. And uh, there's a difference in, in uh, you know, kind of a restricted corridor of root space that has been made more favorable for roots. Uh, there's a difference in a tree growing in that versus leaving a big tree in the middle of a construction site when you just stick a bunch of houses around it, because a tree that grows in a kind of a narrow corridor can create roots where it can. Versus, I can explain. You know, a big tree has roots everywhere, and we cut them and compact them, and that's more impactful on the big tree than planting a little tree in it. Did I make that logical at all? We can find planting spaces. We can make the soil better. I get it, though. Planting space is limited, so again, that would steer me more to preserving the big tree. So Terry Gibbs had a last part that I thought I'd wait for other people to get questions okay. too, but he he thought um, he had never heard the comparison between older and younger trees before, and is that something that is widely debated? 
is it something that's widely debated? Uh, I mean, not in the limited case studies and literature I put forth, I guess. Um, the relationship between trunk diameter and uh, canopy volume is not linear. As trees get bigger, their volumes of their canopies get bigger on a on more of a curve. So the bigger trees have bigger canopies. That's the bigger canopies that provide us more benefit. So you could say the benefit curve is not linear either. So if you just look at the raw data of canopy volume relative to trunk size, I would say that is not uh, not up for debate. The research that's showing how fast the fig trees grow and are they taking on more carbon, maybe there's more room uh, to dig in to see what that looks like. Maybe, I don't know, maybe it's not the fact that the trees are bigger and doing more, maybe there's more carbon in the atmosphere for them. I don't, I don't, I don't have a great answer. I'm curious if there's an economic scale of value for a tree based on species, age class, location. That might help some of these cases. Sure. Uh, there is there's a very user-friendly tool called the Tree Benefits Calculator. It can be found online through a simple search Tree Benefits Calculator. You can put in your region of your country, the species you're interested in, and how big it is, and it will spit out of the benefits, the annual benefits that, that tree provides. And that's all peer-reviewed, like scientific journal type stuff. Yeah. Do we have time for one more? I don't know. I'm not sure the time. Sure. Well, really, just sort of a, a comment, and I'm not thinking, <clears throat> since I don't know anything about the specific uh, highway widening project you talked about. But one one thing that I've I've seen, and it's something just to sort of for us all to think about, is that the vehicle miles traveled in the in the United States and in Minnesota, and in many, uh, even in Minneapolis, on many roads, uh, vehicle miles travel is decreasing. So we, we simply do not have what's uh, the trend lines that we've seen since 1945. So, and, and so one thing that I think that it's it's um, it's very hard for us to do is to is to um, is to sort of look into the future, look at what sort of a network of roads might be, helped, and then also sort of ask that very, I think, very difficult question for all of us. And I'm sort of a time day driver. I don't like to be too late, but you know, sometimes when we widen the road, we want people to the 60 seconds or 90 seconds faster. And and traffic engineers are very good at calculating the, the benefits of you know hundreds of thousands of people a month getting there 90 seconds faster, but at, at some point, that sort of, you know, to what extent do we frustrate people and keep roads somewhat congested? Uh, where will they go? Do we have a network of roads that distributes as in pre-World War II suburban uh, uh, buildings? I think there are just a lot of questions around, around road widening. And, and, but I think when confronted with, with the very clear calculations that road engineers do, of uh, we're going to get you there faster. I think there's there's room for sort of challenging and but it's it's a really hard thing to do with this to say I you know I love to get there past too. So. <laughs> well thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I'll stop. I'm kinda of out of time, so I will stop. Well, okay. Oh really? Yeah. We've done okay. time for question and answer. Okay, so when? Um sixty five. So oh, we okay. we got three more minutes. Um Michael Orange had a question. He was just Asked what about bees and EAB treatment? <laughs> uh, yes, uh, bees and EAB treatment. Uh, bees are concerned. Uh, we need bees. Bees are very important. Um, much of the literature that has looked at bees and protecting ash trees has found no great connection between um, ash, flower, pollen, and bee activity. Ash trees are wind pollinated. They don't have nectar. A non significant attraction for bees. Um, when you look at the environmental benefits of losing, you know, hundreds of millions of ash trees across the state, and you weigh that with maybe there's some tiny impact of bees, maybe, I think the scale tips towards this urban canopy, the forest canopy, is providing far more benefits than the current risk um, that we see. And even the, the local bee experts uh, are saying the same thing, not, not just me. Perfect question. 
chill the conversation about, you know. <laughs> Good one. I like it. I like going out on controversy. That way I can just put the microphone down and nobody can follow up. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much, Jeff. For those of you here in the room with us, there are bagels, juice, fruit, all kinds of treats up here for you. Please help yourself. Um, and we're going to shift a little bit to these mini sessions. Oh, good call, Gary. Why didn't I think of that? <laughs> I will invite Gary Johnson up here. Gary is a professor of urban and community forestry at the University of Minnesota, Department of Forest Resources and the University of Minnesota Extension. He's been a faculty member at the U since 1992. Welcome, Gary. Thank you. Thanks. All right, can everyone hear me all right? Great. So, all I have still there. OK. It's something I know about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is this normal? <laughs> I think it's cute. You know, there are so many communities in the United States with unfortunate names. Intercourse, Pennsylvania. <laughs> Skagsville, Maryland. Motley, Minnesota. Normal, Illinois. Uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of a, a case study, a little bit of the history of normal and what they have done that I found so remarkable. If you have a lot of technical questions, the reference to uh, a specification guideline that you can get right off, right, right off the, the internet. It's four pages long. It's going to have all the, the keen data that you're going to be interested in. I am just here to get you excited about the potential of something and to introduce you to normal Illinois. So this was the this was the vision for the uptown normal circle and streetscape. It's kind of pretty. It's always pretty. It's a very easy to draw things. I've spent a lot of my life drawing pictures of landscapes the way they're going to end up, and it's very easy to do that on a drafting board. Uh, it's a little bit more difficult when you you have to actually see it to fruition and live long enough to see it to fruition. But I was fortunate enough to be in this area to give you a little bit of background. Uh, on July 12, 2014, there were five plus inches of rain. It was one of our typical deluges that's been, you know, becoming more and more common with climate change. And I'll give you a little bit of a relative position of where normal Illinois is. But it was near Champaign-Urbana, and that's where my niece was getting married. That's why I was there. And in Champaign-Urbana, when the storm hit, we were basically stranded at the hotel for a while because the water table in this part of Illinois is very, very high. It's very heavy clay soil, and it drains poorly. And because of that, everything flooded. It's flat as a pancake, too. If you think of the Red River Valley, Red River Valley is like hilly compared <laughs> to uh, this part of Illinois. So that gives you a little bit of a perspective. So uh, five plus inches of rain. And Hours later, this is what the, this community looked like in Normal, Illinois. This is the uptown uh, area of Normal, Illinois. So we're looking at what it looked like just relatively few hours later. What was interesting is the pavement was dry. Um, they, there was no debris on the street that usually you see after one of these torrential rains that picks up leaves and sticks and mud and compost and mulches. And, spreads all over. But when you look at these pictures, and these were literally taken hours after that storm, there's none of that. People were back out in the streets. The streets were nice and dry uh, above ground. The mulch was still in the beds. The plants looked fine. Everything seemed to be normal, normal Illinois. So I found this very, very remarkable, because going from one community to the next, uh, in that part of Illinois, this, this is only 45 minutes from Champaign, Urbana. You would see different communities that were still underwater that had mulch spread all over by water, and that were basically messes. And you, and you go to this uptown area, and it's just remarkable. How on earth did they get a vacuum in there that fast to vacuum up all that water and debris? Well, they did, because it isn't normal below ground. And below ground, this is um, a little bit of a schematic, and we're going to refer back and forth to this as 
we go through of what actually is below ground. And what is below ground is, whoop, I did the same thing that Jeff did, didn't I? Mm -hmm. So right in the middle. What is below ground are suspended pavement systems for the trees. There are a number of cisterns that capture water, the rainwater. And then remarkably, too, the cisterns don't just hold it and let it in percolate down to the soil. They keep using it. So the cistern water is then used for the fountains, for the little the streams that engage people in this area, and for watering the trees. So it's a really nice, complete uh, system in this area. So where is normal Illinois? Well, it is a little bit north of central Illinois. So there's normal, and just 45 minutes away would be Champaign-Urbana. I keep saying that because that's where the University of Minnesota, or University of Illinois is, and a lot of people are familiar with that area. And if you look closely then, uh, focus in on normal. Normal is a twin city like Minneapolis-St. Paul, so it's blooming to normal. And because of that, it, it is kind of a, um, a destination area. There are a number of universities there. Uh, there is a lot of commerce there. And it, it is an area that attracts a lot of people. Oops, let's get back to this. So in 1857, it was established as a normal university. And the normal university is a teacher's college. That's all it is. It goes back to a European system of setting up these universities or colleges that were very general. And they would train people in just about everything so they could become teachers. And so they were called normal colleges. And the name kind of stuck. Uh, prior to that, the, the uh, community was called a junction. It, it was kind of uh, not much better, really, than normal Illinois. So uh, it became this university that today now is Illinois State University, which is one of the larger state universities in the United States. It's about 23, 25,000 students. It has a full range of programs. And again, it is a destination. Uh, the community itself, normal Illinois, that half of the Twin Cities, takes up about 17 square miles, or about 52,000 people that are permanent residents, so not counting the students. There are three colleges and universities. <clears throat> but more importantly, what I'm going to introduce you to is this sustainable and vibrant shopping area, entertainment area. And it's called the Uptown. I don't know why they don't call it downtown. It's called Uptown area. And this, this area I'm pretty familiar with. Um, many years ago, I was at Illinois Wesleyan University, and this is pretty much what it looked like at that point. Illinois Wesleyan is in Bloomington, just right across the property line. And this is fairly typical. It was a vibrant community back then, but what was different about it, it was a very green, hostile community. Uh, trees were planted like they are in our communities in Minnesota to die. So they would plant, and they would die, and they would dig them up, and they would plant new ones, and they would die, and they take them up and, and plant new ones. And, and this was the pattern. Uh, and they were very willing to do it because these little bowies that were there, at least for a time, they gave some green relief to the hardscape. And if you look at this picture, we're going to keep looking back at this picture, except the way it is now. And it is dominated by hardscape. So lots and lots of pavement, very wide street, college students walking all over the place, lots of parking, um, very, very little green in this area. So the, the photos that you're looking at now were taken back in the 70s. Give you a little bit of a perspective of how it's changed. And uh, the mayor of the community I've known for a long time. He and I bicycled many miles uh, together, and he owns this awesome bicycle shop, and he's been the mayor for quite a while. And Chris Coos is one of uh, the great visionaries that I've ever met in my life. And, and for a long time, this was his vision of converting this uptown area that was very vibrant to something more sustainable. And I'll let you make a decision whether or not he's achieved that. So this is a little bit more current. As a matter of fact, this took place, all this work started about five or six years ago. And this was right before it started. And right before it started, they started building in new hotels, because as I told you, it is a destination area for a lot of people. And building in the hotels that were drawing a lot more people, but still the hardscaping that dominated this uptown area had not changed much. So we had this vision. This is part of Chris's vision. By the way, today I'm not going to list any of the vendors. There are a lot of vendors, and I'm going to make this commercial free. So I'm 
we want to stay nice and generic as we go through here. But all you have to do is type in Uptown Circle Normal Illinois, and you can find out every single vendor that works in this area, from the engineers to uh, the landscape architects, everything. But I'm not going to talk about it. This was, this was the vision of turning this nice little quaint a uh, very, very vibrant uh, uptown area into a very green, sustainable area, too. And especially getting trees that actually live, that actually get to the side uh, that's going to be providing some canopy. So as it started out, the, the, the centerpiece is the circle area. And you'll keep seeing this icon in here. And this is right at, it, it's almost, it is a rotary in there, but it, it is also a rotary for pedestrians. So this was really the centerpiece, and the centerpiece was going to have lots of greenery. It was going to have lots of water. Water is the universal appeal for everything, whether you're trying to attract pollinating insects or, or urban wildlife or people. It's water. People like to be water, near water. They like to hear water. This is a very relaxing. It's very seductive for people to use an area. And so they wanted to have this to keep people in this area, to use this area, to think of it as, as this kind of a recreational area. But they also wanted to make it very, very sustainable, too, and not have to introduce a lot of maintenance on it. In particular, not have to introduce a lot of irrigation water. Because they were going to make, by making this very green, and as Jeff pointed out before, as soon as you start urbanizing an area, you totally destroy it the rise of sphere that was there originally, the, the soil profile that was there originally. Every, everything now is artificial. It's urbanized. So how on earth are you going to have a sustainable green infrastructure in an area like this? <clears throat> and that was the challenge. So part of this is the centerpiece today. So if you think back to that last photo I said that it was a photo right before the project started, this is five years later. So you're looking at uh, a little bit of a progress already. And beneath this, below ground, you're going to see that the water that is being captured, and we're going to look at some of the, the watershed for this area in a minute, is going down into these cistern areas, and then it's being recycled to either water the trees or provide irrigation uh, for the other plant materials or provide water for the bubblers, the fountains, uh, and then this really cool little circulating stream that's in there, too. So while it's under construction, it's really beautiful. Uh, and you get a good, good idea of the soil that's there, if you want to call that soil. That, that, I don't even know if I'd call it dirt. That, that's more uh, debris. <laughs> this is what we're looking at, is the debris that's supporting that plant material. So, but this is the area now today. So five years later, uh, it, it's, um, it kind of was good the test of time. You can see that, uh, especially in the sidewalks, the sidewalks are pervious pavement, so they are basically pavers with trap rock, very small trap rock brushed in between. So water, when it hits uh, the sidewalk, percolates right down into what I'll show you is under that in a few minutes. The streets, then, are traditional um, asphalt streets. There's some concrete in there, and most of it's asphalt. And that's going to shed the water rather than percolate it down into it. Uh, but this is, this is part of the watershed today. So we have where people are walking, they're walking on the street. This particular part is concrete, so there's concrete, there's asphalt that's not pervious, but it's pitched to the cisterns. And then you have the green infrastructure in the actual circle area. So this is that centerpiece that we've been referring to. That's five, look at the size of those trees. That's five years of growth for those trees. Not too shabby, is it? You're looking at not trees, you're looking at canopy. And people are in there because of canopy. This is central Illinois. This is the definition of heat and humidity in the middle of summer. It is not fun. It's not nice. It's good for corn. You can hear the corn grow. It's good for hay, alfalfa. It's really tough to sit out in the full sun. So now this environment has been produced there. And the nice thing about it, there are, there are over 58,000 square feet of street surface. So we're going to talk strictly about streets now. It drains into these cisterns. One million, about one and a half million gallons of water are annually sequestered into these cisterns. And it's not wasted. It gets recycled back. And so that water then functions as the water that's used in uh, irrigation ponds, uh, the little stream, the recirculating stream, and the fountain. 
Um, the other thing that's interesting about this, too, is the water that normally, the clean water, the treated water that normally would be used to keep the fountains going to um, water the plants in that centerpiece there would cost the city about seven and a half thousand bucks a year. And as you know, that's not a lot of money. Still seven and a half thousand bucks a year. I'd take it. You can buy a number of trees for seven and a half thousand bucks a year. You could pay for a summer, maybe two summer interns working in the area for seven and a half thousand bucks a year. The point is you saved it. And it's a very functional beauty too. So you have this closed system that's capturing the water from the street. It's going down into the cisterns and then the cisterns are supplying the water for all these amenities that are keeping people there. Now we'll look at the collateral system. So this is now out of the street area and these are uh, two kind of uh, feeder streets that, that go to that central piece. Actually there are three of them. Uh, we're going to look at the sidewalk system now. It's a little bit different. So this is a completely separate system and it is a suspended pavement system. So this is the installation of it. It is not necessarily con continuous all through that area, but what it does do is supply enough volume with good soil. The soil that's backfilled in, into a suspended pavement system is usually a sandy loam soil. And if any of you in here are growers or nursery uh, growers, you know that sandy loam is your primo soil for growing trees. So in the, in the paved um, sidewalk areas that are the previous pavements, the breaks that we looked at earlier, this is what's beneath them, is this really, really good soil. This is what the tree roots are growing in. So now we have a system that we're producing pretty nice uh, trees, five years after planting, uh, pretty nice uh, ground cover plants in there too. Mulched areas, it's looking, it really fills in nice and naturally. Some of the ground cover plants in there are annuals, almost all of them are perennials. Obviously all the trees are perennial. This, does the sidewalk system work? Well, it's very similar to the street system. There are, there's almost 59,000 square feet of sidewalk. It's a lot of sidewalk. Remember, this is a vibrant, vibrant shopping area, commerce area, and so there's a lot of sidewalk area in there, as much as the street system. Uh, there are over 40,000 cubic feet of soil in the, in the suspended pavement areas. It captures, again, one and a half million gallons of water a year, and that is what irrigates the plant. So again, it is replacing water that normally would come out of a spigot or a fire hydrant. It's the water that they capture, and it gets funneled down into where the tree areas are. How many trees are in this area? There's 67 trees planted. There's a mixture of oaks, elms, plane trees, what we call sycamores, unfortunately maples. Uh, the mulches, uh, they're all organic mulches. There's no rock mulch in this area. Lots and lots of perennials, flowering perennials, ornamental grasses, et cetera. Uh, a lot of diversity in this area that just makes it a charming, charming environment to walk through there and, and sit and linger and shop and spend, and spend money. So I ask you, come on, let's go back. There we go. Wow. This healthy looking plants are right back. You know, if we plant the trees in sidewalk, could those trees look this healthy? No. No. Even if in some of the situations where we're using engineered soils, uh, basically class five with a little bit of clay in there, uh, they, they, you know, they're going to do better than if they were stuck in, in junk, but they're not going to do nearly as well as these plants are because they're growing in sandy loam, large volumes of soil. So this is just a picture of some of the oaks there. Now, I'm going to leave this up for a minute. Um, this is what you type in to any one streetscape. And a little thing will come up, it'll say methodologist. And, and I'm noting that only two people are writing this down. I don't blame you. Um, but if you do want to dwell on these uh, pieces of data, this is where you get it. It doesn't cost you anything. It's not hidden information. It's very, very well written too and I think for normal people if, if you work with a community uh, and you need to translate a lot you're not going to have to translate this. They've already translated it for you into normal speak. Um, and it's a little play on words too. So that is it. My name is Gary Johnson, University of Minnesota Department of Social Resources. Thank you for inviting me. We're going to have a um, Q&A discussion session at the end of these committee sessions. So um, 
I'm going to move on to Kirsten Taggart, who is a former Minnesota Green Corps member who served with the city of Hutchinson. She's continued her work with the city as their natural resources project coordinator and also works as an outdoor educator and trail guide with Wilderness Inquiry. She's going to as the opportunities open until May 4th. I have a bunch of information here on the table, and you can take them as you go. And then, Patrick, if people are interested, we can also send those out after. Thank you. Here's Kirsten. Thank you, Sarah. Can everyone hear me? I'm definitely not a fan of microphones, so see how this goes. Um, so like Sarah mentioned, my name is Kirsten. I am a former Minnesota Green Corps member who served with the city of Hutchinson in urban forestry. I will go a little bit into uh, kind of what my project was, just to give you an idea if I know there's a couple of cities in the audience. Um, if you're considering getting a Green Corps member, maybe what that, that project would look like for that Green Corps member. So I need a clicker. First of all, um, so how to tap into Green Core power? Sounds exciting. Um, so what is Green Core? I'm going to explain a little bit about the program, and um, like I said, I'll take questions afterwards. So this picture here on the slide, you can see me in the front, um, was my cohort. I guess you could say a Green Core member in 2013 to 2014 with this group of 28 awesome people. So the Green Corps program is a statewide program to help preserve and protect Minnesota's environment. And something I would note with this program that for me was an incredible experience is the opportunities they give you for professional development. So really, honestly, as an AmeriCorps program, is one of the programs that really seeks to give you, um, you know, real life experience and training. So it is coordinated by the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, and it's recognized as an AmeriCorps program. So there are two, I guess, key components or two key groups to the Green Corps program. And the first one I will go into our host site. So like I said, my host site was the city of Hutchinson. And these host sites are usually educational institutions. Um, so I know last year we had University of Minnesota Morris as one of those. Uh, nonprofits and local government. So that includes any cities or counties. The members serve in four primary project areas, and that includes air quality, waste prevention and recycling, green infrastructure, and living green outreach. I will point out green infrastructure um, because that is where urban forestry falls. And then lastly, the host site is responsible for providing support to the member in order for them to carry out their project. So that includes having a supervisor on site for the member to, you know, run their project by, get some guidance, um, and really kind of act as a mentor to that member. Also, host sites are responsible for providing an area to work, um, email and phone access. The other key um, group in the Green Corps program are the members, of course. If we didn't have members, the project would, the program would not be happening. Um, so this year, there are, they're expecting to bring on 40 full-time Green Corps members, which is great news because, like I said, when I served, there was 28 members, so the program is growing. Uh, these members serve 11 months, and on average, they will work 40 hours a week. It's a total of 1,700 hours within that 11 months that they are supposed to complete. And the timeline for the members, they start their service term, term in September and will wrap up by mid-August. Okay, here we go. <laughs> so I'm hoping that this image kind of brought on a little bit of a negative emotion maybe for you. I know for me it does. Um, this is what my assignment was as a Green Corps member. I focused on emerald ash borer. 
Like I said, I was with the city of Hutchinson, which is about an hour 15 minutes west of the Twin Cities. And they do not have the emerald ash borer currently that we know of. I will say that very carefully. Um, and so I was brought in to the city to help them prepare for emerald ash borer. Um, really get the community engaged and knowledgeable about what emerald ash borer is. Um, and also help the city develop a long-term project to deal with emerald dash for. So this is after Jeff's presentation. I'm a little bit nervous now. Um, so the forestry diversification project was one of the biggest successes um, of my Green Corps experience. And essentially, this project was something that the city of Hutchinson um, had in mind for a while on, you know, how are we going to deal with emerald ash borer on the front side before it actually gets to the city. And diversification was definitely one of the big things that they thought about and that they wanted to see happen. Um, on the picture on the right there, you see this is a street in Hutchinson. And as you can see, it is lined on both sides with ash trees. And they're gorgeous. They're mature ash trees that are definitely providing a lot of benefit. But we have about, I would say, five pockets of these similar ash lined streets in Hutchinson. And we were worried that when Emerald Ash Borer comes through, what's going to happen to these streets? So the diversification project, um, it was definitely a huge undertaking, and there was a lot of things that went into this project. And just as an example for any of you considering having a Green Corps member, um, some of the stuff I worked on for them for this project was updating their tree inventory database. So making sure that they had you know, the proper species put into the database and what size and what condition these trees were in. And then secondly was educating the residents on it. Um, you know, educating residents on you live on a street that's lined with ash trees. And this is why, you know, when emerald ash borer comes through, it may be detrimental to this street. So just making sure they were aware about emerald ash borer and how to identify it. A third thing we did was we had to have this project approved, of course. It was a city project, so we had to go to city council, and I did that absolutely terrifying presentation to city council on why they should accept this project, which is in the past. And I am glad to say that it was approved. And so then the final thing that I did for the city was implement their first pilot project. So we chose an area that was similar to this um, picture on the right here, where it was, I would say, 70% ash trees on a four block radius. So it's pretty high. And went through, did some inventory on the trees, found ash trees that, as part of the regular city program, would have been removed, just because they were either hazardous or they had reached maturity and they were in poor condition. So we noted those trees, and there was 24 of them that we had removed, and this is why Jeff's presentation scared me a little bit. <laughs> um, so we had those trees removed and replaced by alternative species. And that was the goal of it all was to just increase diversity in that area. So, and I'm sure you've already kind of read that definition there on the left-hand side. That's essentially the basis behind the diversification. So that is the big thing I worked on as a Green Corps member. And then secondly, any former Green Corps, current Green Corps members will probably echo that education and outreach is a huge component of this program. Um, so for me, I sat down with my supervisor with the city of Hutchinson, and we tried to really figure out what this was going to look like. What did we want to educate? residents about, did we want to educate residents, did we want to educate city staff, um, and really figure out a plan. So we identified that the residents were definitely in need of, you know, education around emerald ash borer, 
and what to look for, but also why that was important. Why, why is the urban forest important? So there was three primary, um, I guess, aspects or methods that we used as part of this approach. And the first one was volunteer engagement. Um, Hutchinson is a great community, definitely Oops. Definitely um, stole my heart while I was there, and we had some awesome volunteers that we were able to recruit throughout the program, and they helped with our tree planting, but also just um, being a voice in the community and sharing the information. Secondly, I did so many presentations while I was a Green Corps member that it was, it was completely overwhelming, but it was good, and I think that was definitely um, a positive aspect in the community. And then lastly, um, I hope the city developed just some methods for getting information out into the community. Um, so that included, if anyone has heard of the iTree software. Okay, I see some nods. Um, so just, you know, plugging the tree inventory that we had in the city of Hutchinson into that software to come up with a way to show residents simply, you know, what are the benefits of the urban forest in a straightforward way. Um, also, we put together a recommended list of tree species specifically for Hutchinson to plant, um, and I think that's been really useful for the residents. I had to put this in there because this is one of, from one of our volunteer tree plantings, and it makes me smile. And then lastly, the third thing that I really focused on as a Green Corps member was tree inventory and inspection. And I purposely left this slide blank because it was it's straightforward. I was out taking inventory, um, looking for you know, ash trees that were in poor condition that might be able to be removed as part of that project. So, oh, the possibilities. Um, I wanted to touch a little bit on, I just gave you an example of what my project looks like as a Green Corps member. And I was looking into this year's Urban Forestry Green Corps members and their projects. So we have someone in the city of Mankato who is really working on getting a citizen forestry program up and running. Um, in addition, they're working on community outreach and education. And that's essentially around, you know, what are the benefits of the urban forest? Um, and inventory, of course, that's a big aspect. And then, I have a lot of things in my hands right now. So City of Prior Lake, this is um, one of our, another one of our Urban Forestry Green Corps members serving with the City of Prior Lake. And they are really working on completing um, inventory for trees and in natural areas, so specifically focusing on their parks within the city. Um, definitely using that inventory data they are collecting to show residents the benefits of the trees. Education and And then lastly, this one I'm a little bit more close to. I was biased, and this is actually a picture of the city of Hutchinson, which is in McLeod County. Um, but we have a member working with McLeod County Extension, and she's really focusing on, you know, bringing communities together to figure out a way um, to have them put together a program where they can do tree inventory. For example, Glencoe. Glencoe doesn't have a full-time city forester, and so really getting those smaller communities on board with tree inventory and being prepared for the arrival of any invasive pests or diseases. So those are just some of the possibilities of what a Green Corps member could do. Um, and this is the most important part. So if you are a city, local government, um, which I'm sure we have quite a few out there today, nonprofit or educational institution, and you're interested in being a host site for a Green Corps member, I definitely encourage you to look into it. Um, 
and this is how you're going to apply. So, like Sarah mentioned, they are accepting applications for host sites until May 4th of 2015. Um, so, first of all, I would encourage you to really identify the need within your forestry program. Um, do you need help, you know, mobilizing residents, educating residents around urban forestry? Do you need help having someone, um, you know, manage your invasive species program for 11 months? Be creative. Definitely, it goes more than, it's more than just tree inventory, so keep that in mind. Uh, second of all, go to the Minnesota Green Corps website, and we do have some flyers in the back for people actually here that you can take with you too. And there you will, um, you know, see all the directions for how to get an application packet and how to complete the application process. Questions? I would um, suggest that you direct those to the Minnesota Green Corps email address, since I am not directly affiliated with the administration of that program. And then I will let you read this long quote. Here's that. Looks like we're all kind of the same pace as far as reading. Um, so this is, I just had to throw this in there. Michael Baugh was my supervisor out at the city of Hutchinson. And yesterday I put him on the spot and asked for a quote that I could include in this nice presentation on his experience with Green Corps. And as you can see, definitely positive. And um, I'm hoping that this presentation really gave you a kind of how-to rundown on um, considering getting a Green Corps member. Woo! Thank you. And then if you have specific questions for me, I can answer those later. But um, please feel free to email me also. Thank you. Who wants a Green Corps member now? Everybody. Um, do you have Valerie? I'm going to call it Valerie Price. Valerie, I don't have your bio, but I can read it here. Valerie's been the Urban and Community Forestry Volunteer and Program Coordinator at the U of M for the past four years. She has a guest in horticulture and a minor in urban forestry and is completing her education master's degree in adult education. Valerie has extensive experience developing volunteer programs that require higher levels of education for the volunteers. She is also well versed in creating flexible volunteer programs that fulfill the needs and capabilities of multiple organizations. Take away, Valerie. Thank you. As far as all of the initial parts, I'm used to getting a pause before I do anything. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to talk to you guys today about building capacity through the use of volunteers. Um, and, and we're going to do it this way. So this is a pretty complicated running out in front of that. Bad news, all like suckers. I mean, budgets have been cut all over the place, right? Um, and I think that there are a lot of scenarios and opportunities to fill those gaps with the use of volunteers. So we'll talk about that. So we have, I work for Gary Johnson at the University of Minnesota, and we manage the Minnesota Tree Care Advocate Program. Um, and before, with that, along with our CEP, which is the Community Engagement Project, we did a number of tree inventories helping to train volunteers in how to complete tree surveys. So they weren't full inventories, but they were statistical tree sampling. Um, and that kind of has allowed us to spiral out into a lot of really phenomenal engagement opportunities. So a lot of these communities, not all of them, but a lot of them started with a tree survey. Um, some of them we worked with directly. Some of them heard about our project 
and we were able to just help push them along with the research that we had already developed. Um, so like the city of Maple Grove, we didn't always work with directly, but one of our teacher advisor volunteers became a huge part of that, and he actually dragged along uh, Frank Campbell, one of the city public works guys for a trans inventory project, and she's like, we have to do this. And, um, and, and she convinced him, we did it, and now Maple Grove, ha Maple Grove has a full tree inventory. Um, yeah, pretty funny. So, um, so, I mean, and look at it, I mean, we can do this anywhere. You have Ely, Hibbing, all the way down to Rochester. Um, this can be any community, any size, any budget. Um, there, are, there are always opportunities to engage volunteers. So let me start. So Ely, Minnesota uh, had actually heard about our tree survey project, contacted us, and asked, like, can you help us? And um, so we worked directly with them. Um, and originally, this community started out in Ely where they, they weren't planting any trees. They were simply cutting down trees um, due to risk assessments and things like that. And they didn't have a budget to plant any more trees. Their public works guy was like the street guy and I think one of their city administrators and did some of their accounting stuff. Like it was all around that kind of thing. And actually, because they were only cutting trees down, the citizens there had a really adversarial relationship with their city at the time. They were really upset. They didn't understand why the trees were being cut down. And when they contacted us, we started working with them saying, you know what? Just building that relationship, we talked to them about why you would cut down some of these trees, what that potential was. Um, and that was really just because of the relationship developed with those citizens on the tree survey. So following up, they've done their tree survey. They have built a community gravel bed, um, which you have, if you have questions about, we can talk about later. Um, but they built a gravel bed and fundraised to put trees in to their gravel bed. So the city didn't provide any money originally for planting. They didn't have a budget for it. But they went door to door. They fundraised. They got these trees. They asked us to come back up to do a tree planting class. We provided that for them. So now all of those trees are planted correctly, which is great. Um, and they set up neighborhood tree planting. So they got other citizens who weren't necessarily part of the tree survey doing the tree planting. And then they asked us if we could come up and teach them how to prune these trees, doing some small tree structural pruning. Um, so we worked with them on the Citizen Pruner Project. Um, it, it was a pilot this last year, and it's been really successful in a number of communities. Um, every community has been different. You have, like the city of St. Paul is just having their citizen printers just prune sprouts and suckers and doing some crown raising, whereas the city of Ely is doing some small tree structural pruning. Um, these citizens started a tree board. They have um, really influenced their city council, and the city council has now dedicated $4,000 to um, hiring two tree consultants, um, private consultants, to look at tree risk assessment and things like that. Um, so a city that was not, and they're, they're buying a few trees. I think they bought four trees last year. Um, but it was a city that wasn't, they were spending any money, you know, except for what they absolutely had to because of risk. Um, and through this citizen engagement, it's a community that's now not only investing in their green infrastructure, but working with local private tree care companies to kind of continue that along. So this is one of our one of my favorite communities because they're so they're so exciting. Um, okay. So Austin, Minnesota. Uh, this is another community that we work with. They um, they had approached us about signage. They just wanted to know about signs. And we took that opportunity, like what signs lasted outdoors for their trees. Um, and we took that opportunity to tell them about tree trek. What the tree trek is, is you, um, you can just have signs that are educational, talk about the tree species, give it linked to a QR code um, so that it goes to more information about what that tree species is. And, you know, how tall it can get, what are its fall colors, things like that. 
Um, but the community really did all of the work to put this together. Uh, they <coughs> funded um, doing the tree inventory for that park. They then mapped all of these trees. They funded a gazebo and a large display map for this project. <coughs> um, really expensive. Um, but they did all of this with just like a little bit of encouragement from, from us and from the city. So now this is a destination park. They were really, I mean, they were just going to label a few trees and now it's this big thing where it's a destination for classrooms that they've been advertising to. Um, they've been advertising to other like local volunteer clubs to help reinvest people into this park. Um, there are a lot of there are a lot of ways to engage this. Um, so, how do you do this? Um, the development process is different for every community. But the first thing that you have to think about is what are you going to ask your volunteers to do, um, and what education level do they actually need to accomplish that? I am a huge I'm a huge fighter for the, the idea that volunteers are capable of anything. They can do anything with enough education. A, a doctor was just a person before 10 years of medical school, right? Um, they can see people can do anything. And a lot of them already have certain education days. Maybe it's not always in environmental resources and things like that. But you can really tap into what they already know. So I could see was something that we really had to define, especially with the Community Engagement Project Tree Survey. What was accurate enough? Um, did they need to be able to identify 100% of the genus species and be able to identify the cultivar of whatever that was? No. <laughs> we decided no. Um, and every community was different, too. Some communities really or just like, we just want to know the genus. Or, no, we want to know the genus species. So what, what does that accuracy look like? Um, and what education do they need in order to get to the accuracy level that you guys are working for? Um, and it, it's the same thing even with the Civic Student Pruner Program. You know, how much education do they need to make sure that they're making good cuts on all of their trees? You know, because you don't, you don't want to especially with a program like that, you don't want them making bad cuts and making your organization look bad, things like that. So they might be getting it done, but we need them to get it done well. <sighs> Motivation. No laugh. Sorry. Come on. So motivation is always super key to getting volunteers engaged. Altruism is a phenomenal thing, um, pretty magical, but people usually want something out of it. Even if it's the feel good, a lot of what we find in natural resources, um, advanced volunteering, is that they really want the education base, and they're really excited to, once they learn a little bit, and they kind of realize that they know what they don't know, they just want to know more and more and more. Um, so, so education can be a real motivator for these people. The other part of it, no, okay. Um, so the search, a lot of communities have had um, varying problems with finding volunteers because um, they'll they'll just put the ad in the local newsletter and be like, oh, I can't, we just can't get it. We just don't, people just don't care in our in our community. Um, but I mean, how often do people read those things? And there are a lot of um, more creative ways to get people involved. So um, extension, every county has an extension office. Um, we've hosted classes there just to see, hey, who can we get that's interested in learning about something with trees? Um, and, then, and then you can kind of promote within that group of people, like, hey, we have this opportunity for you to learn more and get hands-on experience doing this. Um, and, I mean, we talk into Master Gardeners a lot, but 
our champion volunteer in Ely was a nurse who um, became a yoga instructor. She didn't. <laughs> she wasn't in master gardener programs. She was just like, ah, oh, trees. One day she just lit up, and that was that was it. Um, so the master gardener program is a great organization. But even looking at organizations for people that uh, work with organizations that just volunteer, most people really care about trees. When I think about Ely, it was kind of, they have a lot of mining that goes up there. Um, and it was really a factor that brought everybody together. It was something they could all agree on, is that even if they were pro-mining or anti-mining, they could all agree on trees being great. Um, of course, there are people who hate trees, but those are bad people. No <laughs> so, um, so, and then always looking, be on the lookout to self-promote. So many tree people are they're just not as outgoing and like catty and they like trees and they just want to spend time with trees. Um, and and we're all from Minnesota, or maybe we're not from Minnesota. You live in Minnesota now, right? You maybe have taken on some of that internalization of Minnesota culture of like, oh, we just don't talk about ourselves like that. Um, <laughs> but it's good to self-promote because that's how that's how people find out about the great things that you're doing as a community, is how they find out um, that they can get involved with something like that. Um, if you don't talk about it, nobody knows. Um, and, and advertising is great, but word of mouth is so much better. Um, and, you, and you guys find that time after time. Um, so don't give up if you're if you're looking and you haven't found that person yet. Um, just keep searching because you will find somebody who's super excited and invested in what you're hoping to do. Um, promotion that so you can't make make people get in, be interested in what you're doing, but you can really educate on the importance of the work because maybe that's I mean that's sometimes part of it if they don't understand why it's so so important to your community. Um, thinking about Emerald Ash Borer and like, well, it's just a bug. You know, and a lot of people know now that that took a lot of education to get that to get that understanding through. So the Spark Club has been, it is like the thing that has made us successful with our volunteer effort. It was finding just one person one person who was so excited that they picked up what we were doing and just ran it all over town. There's people um, that got their friends involved and um, did a lot of the promotion. They did a lot of the work, even um, because they were so excited about it. And, and we, as you know, even the university or you as a community, you'd only be in so many places at once. And when you find that spark plug capitalize on that person because they are happy to be help to be helpful and they're happy and excited to be doing that work. So after you find that spark plug, make sure to maintain that velocity. Um, send good news. Um, I put out reports of like how many co-dominant leaders have you pruned this year? Um, how many how many trees have you guys planted? Um, how many of them survived? And, and that, that's an exciting thing when you look at most of the statistics. Uh, and then uh, just communicating appreciation, just saying thank you, it really, really goes so far. Um, and then we usually host things like potlucks. What's a better way to thank people than food, right? Food is the best part of um, all of our volunteerism. Gary, Gary has even it down to a, a science, I think, of uh, which communities get the, the Oreos with the mint inside and which communities get the double stuff because we just got it down. <laughs> um, and, and it's a way it's a way to say thank you. I mean, potluck, people want to be helpful. Um, I, found, I, I tried to like, do a cater an event, and they're like, no, but we, do you want me to bring anything? It's like, no, no, no. I said, but, but I, I mean, I could. I could bring something. It's like, okay. <laughs> they just, they, you know, a lot of these people who are engaged with you, they want to help. They want to feel needed. And um, doing an event like that, how it saves money, 
they're happy, um, and then you have this time dedicated to talk about your accomplishments, say thank you again, and inevitably they end up thanking you right back. Um, here in County does this every year, Phoenix Hugo manages a lot of their volunteer efforts to fulfill a lot of conservation districts. And I go to it every year, and every year, three to five of them stand up and they're like, thank you, Gina. Like, we are so happy that you are here helping us help our community. So, with that, that's me. What am I going to say? Um, and you can contact me if you guys have any questions about anything um, related to volunteers or why the man is yellow, um, things like that. I am back up here, but just for a few minutes to briefly go through um, some resources. I, I wrote a grant last year with some help from others, a bunch of others, and uh, so there's going to be a grant program rolling out this fall to support exactly what Valerie was talking about, community volunteers uh, for urban forests. I'm going to talk about that briefly, and then I'm going to um, hopefully get through this in a couple minutes so that we can have some time for Q&A. Okay, so we know that cities want to do the right thing, but also have limited resources. We know that community forests um, are really important, but on the decline, and have ongoing needs. We have to continue to plant and also maintain, as we talked about earlier this morning. Isn't this a creepy picture? Uh. <laughs> um, anyhow, so uh, as part of my work last year, I wrote this grant for LCCMR, and it's uh, lottery money that's dedicated to the environment. And um, the idea behind it was to institutionalize local volunteerism by providing technical and financial assistance to cities. So there's a bunch of people that I worked with. Um, everybody's kind of bringing, Valerie just talked about potlucks, but everybody was kind of bringing their own specialty to the table. So Conservation Corps has tools. They have um, it's an AmeriCorps program, as you probably know. They have um, core all over the all over the state, and so they can help with planting uh, and training volunteers on planting days. We have Tree Trust, who's really good at doing these large scale volunteer events. We have Hands on Twin Cities that are volunteer specialists. Um, we are working with uh, Gary and Valerie at the U, as well as the Nursery Landscape Association and other state agencies. So it's a really nice partnership of a lot of different kinds of entities. But the idea is, sometimes money does grow on trees. It's a three-year program. It's going to start this summer. And it's going to be, there will be $400,000 available in about 10, eight, probably between 8 and 12 grants, but probably around 10, for cities across Minnesota to implement a volunteer program for their urban forest. So the money is coming to a state agency this summer. They will take a couple months to develop the RFP, and then this fall there's going to be an RFP available for you to apply to be one of these approximately 10 cities. So there's my commercial. Um, I also, for those of you here, I have an infographic about the, the uh, grant program itself. It's on the back table. Um, but I guess I just want to thank everybody for being here and move to the Q&A part of it. Anybody have questions for Gary, Valerie, Kristen, or my Uh Terry Gibbs has a question for Gary. Um, so the your example from Illinois was great. He's wondering how much more expensive it is to do that type of development than a typical um, than a typical just a standard development. Um, it was also saying to see the five year tree growth and wondering if there's any downsides other than cost to creating and manufacturing a site like they did. You have to look at cost you know, from two perspectives. So I get this question all the time. Like, how much more money am I going to have to spend doing it this way? Uh, you're actually going to save money because you're not going to be replacing those trees every 10 years. That's the average lifespan of an urban tree, especially when it's stuck on the sidewalk. So if you wanted a greenery, 
and in an urban area like that, you would have to ask yourself the question, do I want to do it right in the beginning, invest a little bit more money, or do I want to keep spending money replacing and fixing up the space for the, for the rest of the time I'm with the community or the trees that are there? That is a much, much more expensive alternative. Everybody or anyone that's ever had to go into an urban situation, cut down a tree, rub it out, plant a new one, never ever wants to plant a tree again in their lives. They used to be <laughs> accountants or something. Um, that is not fun. It's very expensive. So is it more expensive? No, it's cheaper. And it's always even cheaper yet to do it during a redevelopment project like normal Illinois did, like Minneapolis has done, like Excel Energy Center was done. That's when it's cheapest, when you already have everything torn up. That's all I have to say about that. Other questions? Um, I got a question for Kirsten. So you had a chance to see, as I recall, in Hutchinson there was a, a city forester. I'm just curious about <clears throat> what was the city forester spending like the <clears throat> main sort of bulk of their time on? <clears throat> Clearly, city foresters are stretched thin, and I'm just uh, you were there to augment and do things that um, that person wasn't done. So I would be careful about coining him as the city forester just because he is um, basically half forestry and half parks department, um, which I think is very typical for some of the smaller communities in Minnesota. And as far as the forestry side, when he did get time to really dedicate to that, um, a big push was the forestry diversification project. So getting the community prepared for Emerald Ash Borer and other invasive pests. Um, but honestly, most of his time is spent responding to resident requests. Um, so if he, he gets a call from a resident regarding a boulevard tree that potentially is hazardous, um, so he'll go out and check that. Or a question about, what's wrong with my private tree? Um, so that's really the big push for him is just um, answering those resident questions. I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Okay. I have a question for Gary. Um, you had mentioned with the Illinois project of the types of trees that they planted that one of them was unfortunately maple. And I was wondering what made it unfortunate. Because maples are overplanted in the in the Midwest, especially the Midwest. In Minnesota, I think a lot of people falsely believe that green ash is the most overplanted tree. Green ash is actually number three. The most overplanted urban tree in Minnesota is maple. Second is spruce, and then a distant third is ash. We all understand the, the pain that we're going through now with the potential loss of number three. Can you imagine what it will be if we also lose the number one? And Illinois isn't any different than any other state in the Midwest. It is dominated, the urban force dominated by maple. So that's why I said, uh, unfortunately. And then without naming the variety, it was just a really unfortunate choice of, of an unfortunate genera. Did you say in Minnesota or in the Twin Cities that maple was the most? The question was, did I say in Minnesota or the Twin Cities? Minnesota. Minnesota, the number one tree in urban forest all through the state of Minnesota. Every single community in Minnesota has been um, surveyed or inventoried on um, uh, public property in the front yards. And maple dominates as number one, spruce number two, and ash number three. And you're going to have wiggle room uh, depending if you go from community to community, sometimes ash will rank higher, sometimes ashes like the seventh or eighth or ninth. So it kind of goes up and down. But statewide, yeah, we're, like, we're obsessed with me. <laughs> uh, I'd like to piggyback on that from a city perspective. Um, we have development or redevelopment projects coming in because we're fully built out. Um, the, the plans that are coming in to approve the landscape plans are almost all autumn blaze maple. 
And a lot of times, uh, developers are not hiring landscape architects or horticulture or landscapers to do the planning plans. They're being done by civil engineers or architects on the project who are not familiar with these diversification clearly. So when you start marking out the plans to suggest other things, uh, you're accused of you know, taking over the design process. But out of ways maple is just it's out of control. So I just want to thank everyone for being here. Thanks to everybody on the webinar. Um, I hope you can learn today. And uh, please follow up with your Minnesota Green Court application if you're interested. We're here to answer questions. Thank you.